Hi students, this is the audio for week seven preface slides. Uh, just before I dive into this, I just wanted to give students a couple of suggestions for doing well in the course. Uh, students often um, over the years have asked me for suggestions on how to do well in the course. So today as I was designing these slides, I was thinking about it a bit. And, um, you know, as I always said for the first, you know, weeks one through six, these preface slides are really giving um, those students who don't have a lot of experience in public health and or research some of the foundational concepts that are needed because the lecture segments may assume a certain level of knowledge that most of you may not have. So um, so definitely listen to the, the audio um, first uh, for the preface uh, slides before diving into the segments. So that's an obvious suggestion. But especially for this week, and this, this may hold true for previous weeks and future weeks, but especially for this week, um, I'm feeling that if you listen to this preface slide audio after listening to the segments as well, it'll really help to tie everything together. Um, because you might not get everything uh, that I'm talking about when you listen to this before the segments. You'll probably get most of it and you'll get the foundational concepts you need, but after you listen to the segments and then come back to this, it's going to really tie it all together, I think. So try that strategy out. Um, that's what I would do. This audio is not going to be that long. It's only four or five slides, so it's not that detailed. Um, but I think that strategy will work. You, help you to tie it all together. Um, the other suggestion that I give students who approach me, especially during office hours, is, you know, this is an online course now, so uh, just as if you were sitting in a classroom, you need to take notes. It, it's, it doesn't really help most people to learn just by passively listening. Um, I always took a lot of notes uh, whenever I was sitting in a class, and I know I do the same when I, you know, there's a video. Uh, it's like if I think most of you probably take notes I think nearly every student takes notes maybe there are some exceptions there are one or two of you who may not need to take notes but I think most for the most part if you take notes in class you also need to be taking notes when you're listening to all of these audios it's the same idea and as you write something down generally speaking most people actually once they write it down are more likely to remember it and learn it um, and I think what happens is uh, one of the reasons why that's true, and I know it just for myself, is as I'm, as I'm hearing the instructor say something, I'm thinking about it in my own way um, and sort of interpreting it in my own way using my own words. And that's the way I take the notes. You know, I'm writing it down so this way when I look at it later, I'm going to understand it in my, in my own way. Even though I may be using slightly different words, I'm not changing the meaning of what's said. And so that helps because then I'll look at it later and I'll understand it much better than if I just listen to the slides and listen to the audios again. Because now I've already done the deciphering for myself. The other thing that I do, um, which is, you know, it's the same sort of thing, is I start to write it in my own words and then I realize I can't complete the sentence. And the reason why I can't complete the sentence is because I don't really fully understand this. And now I have to go back and look at the slides again or maybe replay the video three or four times to really truly understand the concept. And then I get it, and then I'm able to finish the sentence for my notes. And so that, you could see what happened there. Is if you didn't write down those sentences, you would not realize that you're not understanding it. And so this is forcing you to really understand um, the concepts because you're now going back to actually do the work and truly understanding them for yourself and by doing that work you're going to learn it so much more easily and then when it gets time to you know do uh, assignments projects and exams you, you know you're all you're going to do is just look at these wonderful notes that you have um, and the way to go back to review any of this is to replay the audios. You can rewind, fast forward as many times as you want. Sometimes it's just replaying something three or four times, two minutes of it, three or four times. You're like, okay, I really understand that. 
Um, the other uh, option that students have is not only to listen to the audios, but you can access all of the slides themselves without the audios. Um, right underneath each audio window, video window, is a link to the PDF file of these slides. And when you pull up the slides, for the main lecture segments especially, you'll see notes right underneath each slide. There are a lot of notes under each slide. And those are really des describing the concepts in great detail, um, far more than what can fit on a slide. So those notes really help. Go look at those notes and, and really help, let them help you take your own notes from the material. Okay, it's not only useful to just look at those notes. You have to write it in your own words as long as you are not misinterpreting something. As you're trying to do this and you still don't understand something, reach out to one of us and we'll be happy to explain it. So let's just uh, start now with um, this lecture. So in public health and epidemiology, one of the um, main goals, one of the uh, Sort of our responsibilities is to try to um, address questions of cause and effect. Is an exposure, otherwise known as an independent variable in sociology or psychology, is an exposure causing some health outcome, a disease, otherwise known as a dependent variable, as I've said. And that's really what we spend a lot of time doing. Is there a causal relationship between Eating foods with high calories, people who have high caloric intake, in other words, and Alzheimer's disease. So high caloric intake is the exposure, otherwise known as independent variable, and the outcome, the disease, the dependent variable is, is Alzheimer's disease an example. So we want to know if there's a causal relationship between high caloric intake and Alzheimer's disease. That's our goal. That's what we want to find out. We're limited. It, it's kind of difficult to really get at that because of bias and confounding and all of the limitations that we have that you're going to learn a lot more about in this class. But that's the goal that we want to attain, is to find out whether associations have a causal relationship because then we can try to eliminate exposures or we can implement exposures if they're protecting people against a disease, an outcome. So the way to address these questions, because it's part of our job, is to use several different study designs. Um, and the study design that you choose depends a lot about the characteristics of the study design, which you're going to learn about today. In my course, Epi 610, I spend one week on each study design. So cohort studies, that's one whole lecture. The next week I do case control studies, one whole lecture. So that course is designed very differently. There's uh, different, different objectives and different goals in that class. This one, we do this in less depth. We give you more information, but it's in less depth. So we don't spend six weeks doing study designs. We're going to teach you uh, useful information about all the study designs during this one lecture. But there's a lot to learn about them, and um, I'm fairly experienced with them teaching them, and I've also been uh, doing research using cohort studies, cross-sectional studies, and, ALS and uh, randomized controller trials at Columbia for the past 25 years. Um, so, uh, but, so just pay close attention to these different study designs, because that's what's available for us to try to get at these major answers that we, you know, the major answer of whether exposure causes disease. So what we have to do is uh, determine which study design is best to answer our question. Let's say our question, as I said, high caloric intake, is there a causal relationship uh, with uh, Alzheimer's disease? So once we come up with our research question, our hypothesis, the next step is to actually recruit a study sample. And then, of course, we have to, um, you know, before we can do that, actually, you know, you have to get institutional approval to actually conduct the study. Um, that's called the IRB, Institutional Review Board, will give you that. And then you recruit the participants, and then they have to give their consent to participate. And they you know, understand the risks and benefits of the study. They understand um, the procedures for the study, and they understand their participation is, is um, voluntary. Voluntary. And then once you do all that, then they are able to um, be, you know, uh, begin to, you could begin your data collection on them. So after recruiting them, 
going through all those procedures, you can start collecting data on these individuals because the data is, are, are what is going to give you your answers. Once you analyze the data, that's the way you're going to be able to get some answers as, as to whether a particular exposure may cause a disease. So how do we collect the data? What does that entail once we have our, 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 our research participants? We can do that by administering surveys by mail, but you may not get all of them back or people may not fill in the survey correctly because it's hard. Sometimes we use uh, postage, uh, you know, return stamped envelopes so people return um, the surveys to us. Sometimes it's better to do face-to-face -face interviews instead of um, mailing surveys for those reasons. Um, sometimes um, with face-to-face -face interview, sometimes that doesn't go well because we may not logistically be able to travel, not have enough funding to travel to participants' homes. Sometimes we're asking invasive questions that subjects may feel uncomfortable answering in person, but they feel better just filling out a survey and answering them. Sometimes, uh, depending on the nature of the exposure or disease, we may need to do lab testing or medical testing. If we want to look at um, cholesterol levels, we may not want to just ask people simply, do you have high cholesterol? Because many of them will, will say no when it's really yes, because they're embarrassed. Sometimes it's better to just do um, a, a lab test if you have the funding to do that. Um, we do that plenty of times for all the studies that I've been running. So, uh, you know, it depends really on how much money you have, how much time you have, and what's, what exposure you're studying, what health outcome you're studying. Um, but that's, these are some of the instruments or methods that we can use to actually collect data on our study participants. How the investigation is conducted by the researcher really depends on the, ch on the chosen study design. These study designs that you're going to learn today have different defining characteristics. Some of them are similar to each other, but, but there are defining differences, key differences between each of them. So really hone in on that. There are strengths and weaknesses of each of them. Some of them similar, some of them different. And knowing that as a public health specialist or as an epidemiologist, knowing those key defining features of the study designs, the strengths and weaknesses, helps us decide which study design is best used to answer our question, depending on the nature of the exposure and disease, depending on how much money we have, depending on how, what logistical restrictions we have. All of these things will help us make that decision about what study design is used. But you typically, you know, you have to choose one to use. So with all this said, my suggestion for this week is to pay first, um, pay close attention to the defining characteristics of each study design and their strengths and weaknesses. Okay, very important because that's how we use we make these decisions about which one to use. Also think about since I started off this slide talking about cause and effect, which is the ideal, that's what we want to get to. We want to determine if high caloric intake causes Alzheimer's disease. Difficult to do. We might only be able to say they're associated, but the ideal is to get cause and effect. And so why is this the case? What are the barriers? What, what gets in the way um, to getting that internally valid result? What gets in the way of getting an unbiased result, an unbiased assessment of whether high caloric intake truly causes Alzheimer's disease? Um, so start to think about that because that's really what we're going to focus on this week. We're going to learn about the study designs, learn how to make decisions about which one is appropriate, as I've described, and then we're going to also talk about why it's really hard to talk about cause and effect in nearly every study design. It's really difficult to cause to talk about cause and effect. One of them, one of the study designs, makes it a little bit easier, but still not a hundred percent possible to do. Even in that study design, I'm talking about clinical trials. So that's um, my suggestion. That's where you should focus on um, what what you should focus on here. So let's look at the types of study designs first. Um, 
these are classified in, in three major um, sort of categories. The first study design type that we have is called an obs observational studies. Okay, that's a classification of a study design. The study design themselves, examples of observational studies are case report, case series, cross-sectional studies, cohort studies, case control studies, ecologic studies. These are listed, what's listed here are the observational study designs, and they fall under the category of observational studies. They're called observational because the researcher does not have control over the assignment and manipula manipulation of the exposure. The researcher does not have any control. What does that mean exactly? Right? When it's observational, all you're doing as a researcher is able to observe. So what does that mean? And when you do any of these study designs, all you're doing is able to simply ask people, are you exposed, yes or no? Um, you can do medical testing on them too, but those, you know, the testings aren't 100% right to determine a level of exposure. You are not assigning them the exposure. You're not giving them a bottle of medication and saying, take whatever's in here once per day. Here's a 24 hour hotline if you have any questions. And then, you know, uh, and then following up with them. You don't have control over the exposure, and most times the exposure occurred before you even got to them. So you can think about what the possible barriers would be if you use that type, if you use observational studies, think about what the problem is. The fact that you don't have control of the assignment of exposure means that, again, in any of these study designs, people aren't going to tell you the truth about whether or not they're exposed. One, because perhaps they don't remember. It's possible. If you ask people about their diets, it's notorious for, for having um, uh, recall bias. People don't remember what they ate yesterday, much less two weeks ago. Um, sometimes people are embarrassed by an exposure, um, uh, you know, such as whether or not they've smoked, whether or not they eat a lot of calories. Uh, you can think of a lot of exposures where people would intentionally lie because they're embarrassed. So because of this, you're not assessing exposure classification properly. And that gives you a biased result right there. And, and that limits you right away from really talking about true causation. So observational studies of cause and effect, because they're cause and effect, they can be really difficult to conduct an observational study that provides an unbiased estimate of the effect of exposure on, account, on outcome, particularly for chronic diseases. So we typically describe these studies as showing associations instead, as I mentioned. Um, and this is a very, very important, and that's why I, I, I highlighted it in blue. Because of the reasons that I've stated, even though you want you know, to say that these are cause and effect studies, because that's the ultimate goal, we're really limited here because the researcher doesn't have control over assignment and manipulation of exposure, especially for particularly for chronic diseases. So we're really limited when we use observational studies. Now, I've been running and, you know, um, directing these studies for many, many years. They're very useful because often they can lead the way to other observational studies. And if you find consistency across many observational studies over time on different populations, it, you know, you get close to actually saying there may be a causal relationship. This is how smoking, the exposure, and lung cancer, the disease, was the, the causal relationship between that was, was discovered. Um, through case control uh, studies and through cohort studies. If you look back in the literature, you'll see cohort studies and case control studies were done um, to actually finally get at identifying cause or relationship between smoking and lung cancer. That's one association that's now a causal relationship. It has been deemed a causal relationship simply because numerous observational studies were done over time that showed consistent results without even needing to do clinical trials and on different populations. So you can't rule out observational studies, but you have to be aware that there are a lot of barriers. And one of them is because you don't have, you can easily um, misclassify. And because you're not 
you don't have control over the assignment and manipulation of the exposure. So this is where experimental studies come in, and I have uh, quite a bit of experience with uh, doing randomized controlled trials. I also have experience with doing a cohort study that actually led to a clinical trial because of a result, a very strong um, result that we had in the cohort study led us to actually write a grant, submit a grant to NIA, National Institute on Aging, many years ago to actually look to see if um, estrogen, postmenopausal estrogen use delays the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So that cohort study result that we um, found led us to uh, submitting a very successful grant to NIA, a multi-million dollar grant that let us explore the, that association, premenopausal estrogen use on uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the reason for that is because, again, with the observational study result, although it was um, very positive and it looked like estrogen use may delay, maybe protecting people against getting Alzheimer's disease, we can't say for sure that that's a true relationship without doing an experimental study. So, you know, we had the money to do that and it was appropriate to do that. And so that was our next step. Um, so that's really how these things go. Um, here, with experimental studies, researcher has control of the assignment and manipulation of the exposure. So in our trial, we assigned women, postmenopausal women, to take either estrogen or placebo. Placebo is a non-medicated pill to see if those on estrogen were more likely to um, to have less memory problems than those people who were assigned to the placebo. And we're giving out the estrogen to people, we're giving out the um, placebo to people, we're randomly assigning them, so now we're basic, we know who's taking what. And we're giving them instructions and sitting with them for an hour going through, you know, take this number of pills for this many days and everything's under our control, quote unquote, and I'll explain the quotes, but you guys probably know already. And so, you know, I have control over the exposure, the duration, and the amount, you know, all of that, the dosage and, and the duration. But people will often go home with the bottle and do whatever they want. So um, you just have to know that. So you have control over the exposure, but not 100%. But there are ways to fix that, and I won't go into it now. But, um, but there are ways to sort of offset some of that, is those issues. But even clinical trials are not perfect for that reason. But clinical trials, because the researcher has control of the assignment and manipulation more so than observational studies, they, they're more likely to provide an unbiased estimate. They're more likely to, to fight off some of those barriers at getting at the effect of an exposure on an outcome. Therefore, they're more likely to demonstrate cause and effect, uh, causality. So we can typically describe these studies as showing causality more so than observational studies. These experimental studies are also not expensive and they're not always feasible, um, which is really true. I can tell you from experience, it's not always feasible to do that. Also, you, can't, you cannot um, assign people to a dangerous exposure. Right? You can't assign one group to smoking and one group not. If we know that an exposure is, is dangerous, we can't do that. So sometimes the only study we can do to study an exposure is observational studies, if they're too expensive or if there's a dangerous exposure. Um, what has been uncommon but growingly more common are quasi-experimental studies. These are naturally occurring experiments, and um, and they. But the problem with these studies is that they're similar to experimental studies, obviously, because it's called quasi-experimental. But quasi kind of leads you to believe that um, because they're quasi, uh, you know, you have to be a little bit concerned about the internal validity. What happens with these? Well, with quasi-experimental studies, you're not really having control over the assignment and manipulation of the exposure, um, random exposure, random assignment of the exposure. You don't have that over each individual. So what you usually do is, even though you are choosing the exposure for one group, it's not really individuals here, it's one group of people versus another, you're choosing which group of people are going to uh, be possibly exposed and which group is not going to be exposed, but it's not really done randomly on individual basis. 
So because of this, we have some concerns about internal validity. Um, most of the time, these studies are done. If you're a, a student in the environmental track, um, you may already know about quasi-experimental studies. Um, if you're looking at uh, some type of um, uh, a natural or policy-induced variation, such as pollution um, or uh, public water supply, and you want to study that in one community versus another, um, you can often do, do something like that. Um, these are um, mostly exogenous events. Uh, and and they're, it, what you, what the, pro the problem, the main problem here is that you're not looking at um, individuals on an individual basis where you're randomly assigning them. You're just looking at one community who may have more exposure to some type of pollution level that you know of compared to another a community that you know is not in a community that is has it's the same exposure to a pollution and then actually seeing what the outcomes are comparing the outcomes between the two groups this sounds a little bit like an ecologic study which you're going to learn in this class um, up here you can see that's an, a type of observational study but the difference is that with quasi experimental studies you are still doing the assignment of the exposure you're just not able to randomly assign the exposure on on an individual basis so because of that that random exposure is what minimizes um, confounding and, and bias, and you're not able to do that. So because you're not able to minimize confounding and bias, it decreases your internal validity. It, it, it creates another barrier where my estimate may not be um, unbiased, and I can't determine causal relationship between exposure and disease. But they are increasingly commonly used, and you know, it just as I said, for observational studies, they do have benefits. So let's talk a little bit now about this internal validity of studies of cause and effect, because again, the goal of these studies is to really determine causation. But we're restricted in many ways. So after we do our data collection, we, uh, you know, after doing these studies using a study design, we then, the next step is to analyze the data and calculate a measure of relative risk, right? What's our relative risk? That's the whole th thing that we want to do here is get the result. What's the relative risk for exposure on disease? So remember, relative risk, as you will be reminded, odds ratio, risk ratio. Remember, absolute risk is risk difference. Um, so after data collection is completed, we usually calculate a measure of relative risk because those are easier to interpret. That's what we usually do. I, I don't really use absolute risk. But we do this, um, for example, by first constructing a two by two table and you know entering uh, in, in SPSS the number of people who are diseased and exposed, diseased and unexposed, you know, so on in a two by two table, otherwise known as a cross tab. And once we create the cross tab, SPSS then is able to calculate the odds ratio of the risk ratio. Actually, SPSS creates the cross tab for you as well. And then calculates the odds ratio of the risk ratio for you. So therefore, now you have uh, you know, you have an actual measure. This relative risk measure that we typically calculate and interpret may be invalid due to confounding and or selection bias. It can be invalid also for RCTs. It doesn't necessarily have to be invalid just in observational studies, but they're more so invalid in observational studies because we don't have control over the assignment of the exposure. But this is the entire um, sort of purpose, and this is really the way that it works out. Um, so this way you have some idea of, of sort of the timeline of, of exactly the steps of, of how you, of, of what it involves in doing research. So the reasons why, say we did our study, you know, we had that research question before about high caloric intake and Alzheimer's disease, and I found that high caloric intake, um, those who have high caloric intake had um, three times the risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. Is that really true? Um, or is that exaggerated? Is that too much? Or is it un under-exaggerated? Or is it really the true risk ratio. If it's the true risk ratio, we can say that the result is internally valid. If it's not the true risk ratio, 
if that number, if it's really maybe two times the risk or five times the risk, that would mean that the result that we calculated, the risk ratio that we calculated is not internally valid. So the reason for the, the error or that biased estimate is probably due to either confounding or selection bias. Okay, and that's really the whole point of what I'm trying to say here. You collect your data, you figure out what um, study design is used before you collect your data, what study design is, is um, useful to you. You collect your data, you um, enter it, you analyze it, you get your measurement, uh, risk ratio, odds ratio, and then you try to determine if your study could possibly have um, a val internally valid result, or a, is it possible that confounding may have occurred, a selection bias may have occurred that would result in uh, the res this results in a poor internal internal validity. So, and you see right here, it says quite simply, this means the relative risk that you calculated is inaccurate and does not reflect the actual effect of the exposure on disease. The relative risk is biased. So that's what happens when you have confounding and or selection bias. That risk ratio that you calculate is not really three times the risk of Alzheimer's if you're exposed to high caloric intake. It's really only two times, or it's really five times instead of three times. Um, so... Given observational studies of cause and effect are quite prone to poor internal validity, quite prone to, therefore, confounding or selection bias, it's now conventional to describe them as showing associations. So that's the way I was always trained, is I've always said um, these are associations for observational studies. Is this exposure associated with this outcome? That's the really important part of this. Um, but remember that the goal, and that's true for observational studies uh, for those reasons, but just remember that our ultimate goal is to actually establish cause and effect. So that's why you see cause and effect on some of these, on these slides when we're talking about observational studies. Just know that observational studies don't really truly get at cause and effect, but that's the ultimate goal. So this way we can identify a public health intervention. Once we realize that high caloric intake truly does increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease, and we know that that risk ratio is three times the risk is actually va valid, and that there's no confounding or selection bias present, then we can actually implement public policy to, re to somehow reduce um, high, uh, high caloric intake, just like the way that we did... Uh, um, we prohibited trans fat in, in most everything that we sell these days. I mean, that's how these things, that's, that's how we can implement uh, public policy change and public health interventions as a result. So sources of bias and studies of cause and effect, there are two different so sources. Um, and I'm just going to give you the basics here. I can, I can you know, spend an hour on this, but I won't do that. Um, confounders can be thought of as nuisance factors because they get in the way of obtaining the true effect of the exposure on disease. They bias the observed estimate of the exposure on disease. So when we talked on the previous slide about saying that um, the risk of uh, high caloric intake on Alzheimer's disease was two times, you know, two times the risk, uh, and we, we're saying that possibly that was wrong, that maybe it was just one time the risk, you know, or, you know, 1.2 or three times the risk. Um, we can say that possibly the reason why the risk ratio that we calculated was not correct is because we had a confounder present in the relationship between that exposure, main exposure and the main disease. So if I have something that says if we get a relative risk of one, one means there's no association between the exposure and disease. And so maybe that was the true result. But we got, we're walking around saying that a uh, high caloric intake doubles your risk of getting Alzheimer's, when in fact that might not be true. And the reason why you're seeing that is because there's really a confounder present. There's an additional factor that has now gotten in between the exposure and disease that makes it look like the exposure is doubling the risk of the outcome when it really isn't. It's really due to that third other variable. So let me give you a really example that I've used in Epi 610 for many years. Say we're attempting to determine whether anti-wrinkle cream, 
use, which is an exposure in this case, causes dementia, an outcome. So our study may, may indicate a higher risk of dementia among those who use the anti-wrinkle cream. What's in that, that cream that could possibly cause dementia? Is there a chemical in that? I've never really heard that. And I've been doing Alzheimer's disease research for 25 years. I never really heard that, but it could be possible. Say we found our relative risk for that association between anti-wrinkle cream and, and dementia is four times, 4.2. That was our relative risk, our risk ratio, 4.2. And somehow, people who were exposed to anti-wrinkle cream had 4.2 times the risk of getting dementia compared to those who didn't use the cream. That's very alarming. What may have been going on there? Is there really a chemical? I've never really heard of that. Can anyone think about an explanation for that? What would be a possible explanation? Could there be another variable, such as a confounder? A confounder is simply another variable, another factor factor is a variable, same thing, that is getting in the way and that's actually more likely causing the disease, either in part with the main exposure or, or not even needing the exposure, just purely causing the disease without the exposure. What are the factors may explain that relationship between use of the cream and dementia? Just think about it. What might be related to the anti-wrinkle cream and also a risk, uh, have um, it be a risk factor for the outcome. That's sort of the way you do it. I think some of you have already probably thought of it. It's very easy. Age. Age is, uh, could be thought of as a nuisance variable, an another factor that can get in the way of looking at the association between anti-wrinkle cream and dementia because People who use anti-wrinkle cream are also tend to be older in most cases. And people who are older also have a higher risk of dementia. So really, the result that we found in terms of dementia in those who use the anti-wrinkle cream is really age as the exposure and, anti and, and, high, and dementia. So age is really causing the ex dementia. Or really, it's sort of, I wouldn't even say it like that, but age is a predictor for dementia rather than um, the cream. Anti-wrinkle cream is not causing the dementia. There were no chemicals in that, but it's because older people use the cream. So it made it look like use of the cream results in a higher risk of dementia. So age here is a third variable that got in the way between anti-wrinkle cream use and dementia. So that's one source of bias, confounders. The next source of bias is selection bias. And again, just very quickly here, just for the purposes of this, is selection bias is due to another problem that can get in the way of obtaining the true effect of exposure on disease. Okay, there's something else that can get in the way of getting that real true relative risk. It typically occurs because the selection of the exposed and unexposed people the way that you selected your study participants who were exposed and unexposed is somehow related to actually the outcome of interest. So for example, in a factory, there might appear to be no effect whatsoever on cockroach infestations on asthma. Say the exposure is cockroach infestations and say the, the um, outcome is asthma. We know that that's, there's an association between that. I think it's been proven. It's a causal relationship between that. But say in a particular factory, we did this study, and it looked like there was really no association between cockroach infections, infestations, and asthma. But as I've said, it's known that there is a relationship. We know that it's true because cockroach saliva, saliva and feces trigger asthma. But why might we might not get the true risk ratio? Why, why might we get a risk ratio of one for that, which shows no association with cockroach infestation and asthma? Why might we get one for the relative risk? It might be due because people whose asthma is triggered by cockroach saliva and feces got sick in that working environment, in that factory, and had already left that job because they were ill. 
They have already taken steps to avoid the irritating exposure of the cockroaches. Um, so they left the factory job. But meanwhile, you're doing, so you did a study on those people in the factory. And the ones that actually had the asthma were all gone. So you couldn't, your, your result looks like the, it was, there was no one with asthma. And it made it look like um, you, there's no association when there truly was. But those people who, were, who were, had the disease were all gone. That's an example of selection bias. Why? Because it's the people in your study. It's maybe you didn't select them at that moment, but who remained in the study. The way that you're selecting the people or those who remain in the study is um, if that's biased in some way, that's called selection bias. And for example, in epidemiology, what happened here is that the, the healthy people remained in the study and the the ill people left and so this is an example of selection bias um, more particularly more specifically the healthy worker effect which is a form of selection bias healthy worker effect makes sense because we're only looking at the healthy people in the study because those who really had the asthma had left so that's um, sort of my um, quick preface slide audio uh, let me know if you have any questions again I would listen to this again um, if you feel it would help you after you do the main segments and always always take notes on all of these audios it will really help you learn as I mentioned hope this helps and hope everyone uh, takes care of themselves this week